thanks to tool changes, hot end changes, and regular AMS style systems, multi-material 3D printing is more accessible than ever. Today, I'll share with you all of the tips and tricks for both CAD and Slicer that you need for the best success. There's more and more multi-material options for 3D printing, so it's time for a guide. Today, we're gonna to cover combining different materials and utilize their properties for dynamic parts and also achieve the best overhangs that you've ever printed. I am gonna focus on Onshape and Orca Slicer, but you'll find a lot of the tips are general and will translate well over to other options. Very quickly, some 3D printer updates. Firstly, the Snapmaker U1, which I've used exclusively in making this video. And to clarify, the bed does work for PETG, but tricky prints or small ones are likely to fail, but a dust of hairspray has seen it prototyping parts reliably. I've also done a lot more TPU printing, and the version on the right had the temperature lowered to 225, which has transformed the results night and day with the same filament. I've since done plate after plate of TPU prints with minimal stringing and great reliability. The U1 is currently my favorite and go-to 3D printer in the studio. And now the Sovol SV08 Tool Changer project, and those parts that you saw were designed for it. A magnetic mount for the sex ball probe is now finished, with the electrical connection optionally going through the magnets to make for easy operation. And all of those small TPU parts are to suit the new flat spring umbilical. They slide on before both the power cable and PTFE tube clip into the sides. So far so good on a much more reliable cable management solution. Let's move on to our main topic, and our first point to make is that slicer temperatures and model placement can make a big difference for print quality. And that's because the travel moves for an ordinary print are way shorter than what you'll get on a 3D printer that does tool or hot end changing. And there's two aspects to this. Turning on travel moves in the Orca Slicer preview, we'll see that there's constant long movements back and forth between the purge tower and the actual printed model. But what won't show up on the G-Code preview are the actual tool changes, which require typically long travel distances as well. So my first tip is to place things carefully. By default, most slicers are going to space things out, but there's nothing to stop us from moving the purge tower and the printed model much closer together. And if you can work out which of your filaments is the ooziest, and you know which tool it's loaded up into, moving the whole printed assembly over towards that area as well. Whatever you can do to limit those travel moves will cut down on stringing. This one seems so obvious, but honestly, I frequently forget to do it. Another thing that's easy to miss is the rotation of the model in the slicer, and we need to get this right to prevent an oozy filament from running through and getting embedded in another filament. Let's say we know the grey TPU here is going to potentially string and then run through the PLA. We can make a simple change by rotating the model to make sure that the TPU is facing outwards towards the wipe tower. On this model, it's a complete no-brainer, but other times it's less obvious. For instance, the colored eyes and nose section here, as currently positioned, are going to have the longest distance possible from the purge tower and tool changes. So it makes sense to select the model and once again, rotate it 180 degrees. That will shorten those travel movements and cut down drastically on unnecessary mess and contamination. And finally, you might need to think differently about hot end temperatures when it comes to multi-material printing. And that's because whatever filaments you're not using will be sitting parked potentially with the nozzle hot at least immediately after it's dropped off or immediately before it's picked up. If you can get away with it, it pays to try and lower your hot end temperatures to cut down on ooze and stringing. Working out the best temperature is easy with the built-in temperature calibration test in Orca Slicer. Putting in a range that starts just above what you normally print and then somewhere between 10 to 15 degrees lower. As you can see by the marked temperatures, the temperature will be lowered for each subsequent stack of the tower. The printed model will likely tend to having more stringing down the lower sections and less as we go up. As a rule of thumb, the lower the temperature, the weaker the part, so we're looking to find a middle ground. And to find this, you might like to inspect the underhands as well as snapping the tower to see where it's weak and where it's strong. Because tool and hot end changes exacerbate any stringing, tuning your filament temperatures carefully is even more worthwhile than usual. Let's turn our attention to getting perfect, and I do mean perfect, supported surfaces with multi-material. Now previously, I released this guide video on dialing in your support material settings in the slicer, but it mainly focuses on getting the air gap just right between the model and the interface layer of the support. 
When you're printing with only a single material, you have to have an air gap there or the support material will fuse to the model and you'll never get it off. However, with the advantage of multi-material, if we get the settings right, we can do so much better. We'll set this up step by step on this support test model, link in the description. For the base model, we have assigned pet G. Our first step is to come to the support tab and enable support. Depending on your model, you might need paint on supports, but for here, the defaults are fine. After that, we're going to scroll down until we get to filament for supports. And you might think you should change both of these to a different material, in this case PLA. And that will work, but the reality is, for every layer, we're going to have at least one filament change, as we go back and forth between the PETG model and the PLA support. Note that in this configuration, we have a print time of just over one hour. So instead, we'll restore the support raft base back to the default PETG and leave the interface as PLA. Now when we slice and inspect the preview, we can see that there's only a few thin layers of PLA, meaning most of the print happens from one material, and that saves us 12 minutes of printing time. PLA and PETG will not want to stick to each other. To fix some problems and take advantage of this, we need to tweak further settings. That normal air gap that we tune between the model and the interface layer, well in this case we just don't need it, so we need to set the top and bottom Z distances both to zero. These steps are the bare minimum, but you can see on this version the underside of the T is still pretty messy and it is curled up because the plastic hasn't stuck at all. There's a couple more changes we need to get the perfect result. Our first change is to get the smoothest interface platform possible, so to help that we're going to change our top and bottom interface spacing, setting them both to zero which is the equivalent of solid infill. When we re-slice we can see we have a nice uniform smooth interface layer for the model to then be printed on top of. But because these filaments don't like to stick, we're going to slow down the first extrusions that go over the interface layer, labelled here with navy blue as an overhang wall. We can find this under speed, bridge and external, and I recommend dropping down all the way to 10. If we now preview the G-code in terms of speed, we can see that this section is dark blue and that's 10mm per second, exactly what we need. And despite this slow section, we've only gained 1 minute to the print time, so let's send it to the printer and see how it goes. Our normal layers are plenty fast because they're only printing one material without any changes. And just before the switch to PLA, a PETG dense layer will be laid down as a basis, and then the PLA interface layer will go on top of that, again printed at full speed, more or less looking like solid infill. And then finally, as expected, our overhang layers will go down at 10mm per second, which goes slow enough for two filaments that don't stick to still stay in the right position. And once these outer perimeters are done, the infill will happen at regular speed. Here's the finished model, and the side on the right falls away instantly, and trust me the other side isn't going to be much harder to free. Remember, we don't have any air gap so it is wedged in there, but it's just a matter of squeezing the plastic to contort it enough so it can slide sideways and out. Now the fun bit, our interface layer should peel off perfectly, and look at those undersides. I promised you perfect, and I hope you agree that's what we've attained. They look like solid infill from the top side of the print. This combination works well either way, with either PLA or PETG as the main model, and the other as the solid interface layer. But there are other combinations that work just as well, such as printing with TPU and then using PLA for support material. And since TPU prints much slower, I would have all of the support, not just the interface layer, be done from PLA. I had the wrong temperature setting for my TPU here, so ignore the stringing, but as you can see, the PLA support peels off so so easily and leaves a great overhang. Switching focus to CAD, we can actually design our own custom support blocks instead of using the ones from the slicer. Here we have a step file of a fan that I've imported and a TPU part that I've designed to clip onto the top. Anyway we look at this, it's going to be difficult to print and it's going to need support material. But I think sitting on its side, just like this, will be the optimum. That means we have this whole section on this side that will need support, and then the underside of here that will also need support. So I've designed two custom pieces that I'll export at the same time, so let's have a closer look at them. The gold one is flat and matches the shape, only having a little gap in between, but a gap of zero, that means touching vertically. A blue one has a wide base to stick to the bed, comes up at a 45 degree angle and once again has no gap in between the grey part and the top of the blue. After importing our three parts, we can simply select them and allocate a material like we would any other time followed by applying those same tricks that we used in the previous section of the video. This approach is slower and will use more filament, but it gives us absolute control over where the support material touches the model. As it prints, that slow overhang speed of 10mm per second ensures that our TPU perimeter goes down cleanly, 
much faster and I promise you this will end up a mess. Printing finished, let's remove our model, the support and then inspect the underside. TPU sticks to PLA, a little more than PLA sticks to PETG, so you will need a little bit of persuasion to start getting them apart. But once you get one side free, the other side should simply peel off and you'll be left with a nice clean surface. As for the flat section, I put down a flat scalpel in between the two to break the seal and then inserted a thin flat surface to work my way from one side to the other to break the rest of the seal. Once again, we're left with an absolutely perfect supported surface that looks more like a top layer. So that covers when we want to pull multi-material prints apart, but how about when we want them to stay together? Let's look at some ways to make them interlock and achieve that. Without multi-material capabilities, we'd have to print these two parts separate. And that means leaving a small clearance gap, which means we get a nice snug fit when we assemble the two parts together. This approach is sometimes still the best, as we can iterate the design with minimal waste. But sometimes we want two materials permanently fused together, like this piece which has PLA for the ends and TPU in the middle to make a nice movable joint that springs back into position. On the inside of these three pieces, I have some parts that interlock and let me show you the simplest way to achieve that. Firstly, we have a single sketch that lays everything out. We have our flexible section in the middle and our two rigid sections on the sides. And then just a very simple shape, a rectangle with a larger width and then a narrower connecting one. We start by extruding our center TPU section. For the record, that's eight millimeters high. Then we extrude our connecting section at only five millimeters, followed by our larger bumps at six millimeters. And you'll notice that these are coming all from the same flat plane underneath, because the next step is to mirror vertically, and that will give us geometry on the top and bottom that's going to lock the outer sections in place. The two sides work pretty much the same way. We start with a solid piece, again, eight millimeters thick, Extrude our connecting piece 5mm, this time as a cut, and then our final cut 6mm up before mirroring both sides to leave ends that have a matching cavity to suit the plug we put in the center piece. So in this example I used rectangles, but you could use triangles or another shape as long as it has this hard edge to stop the internal shape pulling back through the other. I think a round edge has a chance to flex and come apart. In our slicer, the only thing we need to do is allocate our filaments. There's no other special changes to make and that will give us our multi-material joint that should not separate in normal working conditions. Pretty straightforward, but if you're looking for an even stronger bond, or maybe just to save some design time, let me show you beam interlocking. In Orca Slicer, if we come to multi-material and scroll down, under advanced, we'll find a setting called beam interlocking. If we enable it and slice and then preview through the G code, we can see that where the two materials touch, the slicer will automatically put in some interlocking beams to strengthen the junction. And the reason this is stronger is because they extend beyond the boundaries of what we designed in CAD. So let's compare the before and after. On the regular version, we can peel back that corner and it will open up until it gets to the junction inside. But the beam interlocking version by comparison is just a little tighter. It will peel a fraction, but nowhere near as much. And if you're not very confident at CAD, we can actually disregard all of those interlocking rectangles from the previous example, leaving just a flat surface between each of the parts. Slicing this normally would have the parts just sitting next to each other and then falling apart. But by simply ticking that beam interlocking box, Orca Slicer will detect where the two materials touch each other and make them interlock without any additional effort from us. I don't think this junction will be as strong as our designed version, but it certainly is easier. But we can also leave out the TPU and combine two rigid filaments with different properties. This version has PLA on the ends and PETG in the middle, which is inherently more flexible and less brittle. After mild bending, like a spring, it will snap back to its original place. Here is a version only in PLA, and a similar amount of bending already gives us permanent deformation. This version is now more like 85 degrees instead of 90. Don't be afraid to experiment to come up with interesting solutions. Here's another example, and let's say we need to print this pin from peak to withstand high temperatures. The thing about that is peak is very expensive. So what about if the outside skin was peak and the inside was a cheaper material? This one has a bit of a trick to it, and you'd think you could just come to multi-material and then set the infill to a different filament like ASA, but you'll find that when we slice and look inside, it's all the same filament. What we need to do is switch from global to objects, have our part selected, and then select the exact same thing from the multi-material menu. Now when we slice and look inside, we can see we have our two filament combination as intended. Almost 60% of the model is now ASA, so that's a good saving of money. Finally, we can use multi-material to get super tight clearances in print and place models. 
If you want to learn how to design your own print in place parts, I have a specific tutorial linked. To simplify it, we need to pre-plan what will move and then put in clearances between those objects so they don't become fused during printing. This 100% works, but it tends to leave some clearances that make the part pretty sloppy and add degrees of freedom that aren't intended. Multi-material printing will let us overcome that. For instance, here we have a simple mechanism where the gray piece can slide back and forth inside the blue. And I've set a side clearance between these two parts as 0.1 millimeters with a vertical gap at the top and bottom of the gray piece of zero. In the slicer, there's nothing special. I've just assigned PETG and PLA for the two parts and I've used PLA support on the underside of the PETG component. And here is the printed result. Because the two filaments are black, they look like they're printed from the same material. But if we apply some pressure to the internal component, it will slide back and forth just like we want it to. However, there is absolutely zero play in any direction. No amount of twisting or bending can get these two to wobble independently. This is an extremely precise junction thanks to multi-material printing. That's a collection of my best tips and tricks at the moment, but you can be a real one and share some of yours in the comments section for others to benefit from. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy multi-material 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you liked the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.